So uh, he's um, a leading authority on ethics of access and success in higher education. Isn't that dear to us? He has worked in the field for over 30 years. He founded the lead uh, and led, leads the National Education Opportunity Network, which is the UK professional organization for access and equity in higher education. And over 100 universities are members. He has also uh, founded the World Access to Higher Education Day, which has reached over uh, 1,000 organizations from over 100 countries. He is now the of the development of the World Access to Higher Education Network, which will take him to the work of um, uh, the work forward. So he is also uh, a research for the UNESCO the World Bank, the uh, European Commission, the British Council, and the Association of South East Asian Nations. I must say this is fantastic to have a last email talk to us about things that are very important <coughs> to both of our countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, colleagues. So, uh, anticipation should be fever pitch now, after being no lights. So, <laughs> now hopefully I'll be able to uh, meet those really high standards. So, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Congratulations to you for making it here the last morning. <laughs> we were a real stars, you know, when you came in after last night's dance, etc. It was a wonderful thing, yes. I did dance myself, but I was close to the dance floor. I <laughs> got <laughs> dance in the UK, it's so about quite a lot more alcohol than you guys had, so it was really exciting stuff. So, so this morning, as I said, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about my own journey first, before I talk a bit about my work in the UK, then something about what's happening internationally. To try and really, I guess, place your work in that global context. But before I start, I mean, I might be keen out here, but I guess for me, I've been here since Tuesday, and the real stars are the students and those who live in the program who've come and spoke in the session, the breakout sessions about their work. They're real keynote people. I'm just here to entertain you on Friday morning, so <laughs> that, that's what I'm here to do. But you've got your stars, I'm glad to you. But at the same time, you know, some of us very lucky to be able to go and speak in different places. And for a lot of people, it's a big deal to come and speak at the conference like this and talk about your work. So I, I really recognise that. I've learned an awful lot uh, for being here. But firstly, I guess I want to talk a bit about well, how I came into this area of work. I mean, what binds all of us in here, I guess, is the journey we've taken. You know, for many of us, the work we do is built on our own uh, experiences, our own history. And I went different in that work. Uh, I've been looking to be able to pursue through my career things that I believe in, like you believe in, the things that come from my own experiences. So I've got a first picture for you. This is a picture from the town that I grew up in. It's a place called Blackpool in the UK. And this is Blackpool Tower. So the founders of my town decided they would look at Eiffel Tower they build a smaller tower, we call it Blackpool Tower, to try and make it a bit like Paris, but smaller. Now, it doesn't sound the greatest idea from the outset, but Blackpool is a seaside resort in northwest England, it's near Manchester, and it's a small town. Now, it's called Blackpool because the sea is a bit murky. It's not kind of clear how the wonderful seas here, here in Africa. Well, Blackpool, unfortunately, like many seaside resorts in the UK, has, over the last 30 or 40 years, had difficult economic times. In the UK and the country, seaside resorts tend to attract people to come on holiday, but also kind of attract a lot of poverty. So I didn't grow up underneath that tower. I grew up here. This is a high-rise estate in Blackpool. Now, relative to, and not relative to, the experience you have here. Relative to my country, uh, this is one of the poorest parts of Blackpool, one of the poorest parts of, of England. South Africa is really important to me because my father lived in South Africa from 1950 to 1965. Uh, then he came back to England and then uh, he had me. And he didn't, he wasn't a campaigner, he was a builder. 
Uh, he had no academic qualification, he travelled around, he spent time in, a long time in this country. His heart was always in Africa, so when I was growing up, he talked a lot about this country, he had to leave. I won't tell you why, but it was, he had to leave. But anyways, what it is that, yeah, that's where I came from. But I went to university, I was lucky enough to go from this place to this place. This is Trinity College, Oxford, one of the oldest colleges in the University of Oxford. And uh, many of you will, I guess if you've heard of any university in the UK, you've heard of the University of Oxford because of its profile, its attention, etc. So for me, going from that council estate to that place when I was 18 years old, and I've never left, I left Blackpool once before that. I never left Blackpool, never even gone to Manchester, that I went to that. So that was a huge journey for me, and that transformed everything about my life. And from after leaving university and doing my, my doctoral studies, it became apparent to me that while I started as a lecturer, as a sociology lecturer, and I enjoyed teaching, and I still do some teaching, I really wanted to support and contribute my work to help others take that kind of journey. Maybe not such a long journey, but that journey from places where you're told that you don't go to university, it's not for you, it's for somebody else, you're going to be a plumber or a builder, it's a fine thing, but if you want to go to progress, you can't. You're giving those people the opportunity to support you to do so. So after some time working for the government, a uh, government-led programme, which then was defunded uh, by the Conservative government, which hopefully will be out of office a week today. <laughs> Who knows? Well, there will be out of office a week today, so that for me is a great thing. Not that uh, I have to like that. But anyway, we'll go But and I went on to found this, as I mentioned, the National uh, Education Opportunities Network. So NEON is a national organisation. Uh, in the UK. It was, I'll say, founded uh, ten, years, uh, 10 years ago. And we support universities in the UK to work on access and student success, both parts of the equation. And I know uh, our conference has been very much about student success, and obviously the concept of South Africa means that access is a good lesson an issue. But it's still very much an issue as well as success <coughs> in the UK. So we found in NEO really, I guess, Partly to um, support the sector, but partly as well, I think, you know, this is again a reflection for me from this conference. I was here uh, when you had that presentation from the lady from the department and she gave you some difficult questions. And, and it came through there that as well as, as having an initiative that brings people together and contributes to shared practice, you maybe also need a voice on these issues. We felt we needed a voice the work we did. Uh, in the UK, so that's how we found NEO. So NEO was founded 12 years ago. We have around 100 universities as members of NEO, it's a membership organisation. We support them in their work through capacity building activities, through trainings, a little bit like you have here. And most students uh, going to education of England are members of NEO. But it's worth pointing out as well that even, you know, we think about England, we think about it as, as an old education system, and um, many universities, not just Oxford, have been there for quite a long time. But poorest students make up less than 10% of all students in England. So despite the work we've been doing for many years, for many people from the estates, that, that estate, that white group has been demolished now and flattened and turned into something else. But those backgrounds still got an opportunity to go to higher education. So I continue to have this work, and, and I guess even after I could stop working, this still could be required. But that's the well, I guess that's the UK context, but really I guess I'm also going to talk to you about the global picture. Because after we found the NEON, we also felt that we had kind of responsibility to work and collaborate with those from other countries. Um, because we, I was looking to work with some people from the US and the policy club. And it became apparent that we weren't the only organisations working on this agenda. So for us, the global picture became really important. And we felt our mission wasn't just to try and support our students and our universities in our own country, but try to work out how can we work with others across the world. So we'll come on a minute to what we try to do in that area. Before we do that though, we're going to take a little step back from what happens in the UK and then a step out a little bit. And so think about what actually is this picture when it comes to inequalities in higher education, access and success. 
across the world. So what's the global picture? Okay. So hopefully um, you get most of that screen down. Let's start with a goal. UNESCO have a goal that by 2030 to ensure equal access for all women and men to affordable, quality, vocational, uh, technical, tertiary education for the university. So there's a goal from UNESCO to try and have this equality of access. But what actually binds universities across the world? You know, in the university sector, we're, we're, we have a lot of conferences and the UK section. We, have, we like to go and talk about how great our universities are and how good our students are and where we search with them. What we don't like to talk about it is the thing that binds all countries across the world that come to higher education. And that thing that binds them is inequality. We did this report uh, about seven or eight years ago called Drawing the Global Access Map. That's essentially what we tried to do, to look at all the data across the world, to work out exactly what inequalities in access and success look like across the world. We produced this map. This is our access map. Now, this shows you the data we found by social background, by gender, by other forms of data. And this is map of the world, okay? So, for quite a lot of countries, we found data on social economic background and gender. Quite a few countries looked at gender, okay? So, well, only a few countries have no data. The few countries that have data for is Greenland. I'm not sure if it's inequality, inequality exists in Greenland. I'm pretty sure it does, but there's no data for Greenland. So anybody knows who in Greenland has any data at that? The economies of Greenland? Well, get in touch with But what we found in this piece of work is this. In 90% of the countries in the world, and in all where we have data, inequalities in access by a few background exist. So across all systems, and the extent of the inequality difference, inequalities in access and success are greater in Africa and Asia than they are in Europe. But well, in all countries where we found data is inequality. So one of the things that binds the global higher education system, as well as the exchange of knowledge and opportunities for students, is inequality. It's not something that's just found in my country, in your country, it's just all the countries that we want to have. The extent of the difference, the certain countries got find good data on social and background, and in certain countries what inequality means differs in that particular context. But it exists. And I guess that's what led us to think about what needs to be done globally in terms of bringing these communities together, these groups of practice together, people like ourselves in this room, in other countries, to see what's actually not just a national challenge, but a global challenge. Okay. So a little bit more on this. I mean, as well as our report, but this report was done by uh, UNESCO, uh, by a fellow at UNESCO, uh, I think five or six years ago. And if you just these reports as well, hopefully we'll be able to share the slides. Because if you're interested in this area, some of these reports are quite interesting, looking at this, this global picture. And the very interesting one at the moment of your student success, I really suggest that, that you might want to look at. But I want you to grasp, but what's interesting is that this report shows that the progress is being made. So while inequalities that exist, it is actually uh, reducing a little bit across the world, particularly when it comes to access and success. Now, the access and success point is very interesting because when it comes to data, and I'll come to this later on, there's better data in most countries on access than there is in success. But well, we can understand, I guess, success by incomplete, but not success by background characteristics. But the way we're concerned in our country is not just who completes, but the people who speak to backgrounds. And that data on who completes by social background, by ethnic background, etc., is less prevalent across the world than data on who actually gets into higher education. I'll show you one graph, because I've been a lot of graphs in the past few days, and you know, I don't want to overgraph it yet. So. <laughs> one, well, I think you'll like this, because this actually looks at completion. So look at, I've got a point to think about. So the laser, the, uh, completion, so those are students assessment. And these are wealthy quintiles. And this research looks at surveys in 123 different countries. It's accumulated data from 120 countries across the world, both from richer countries, less rich countries, etc. So that's global spread of research surveys from 120 different countries. They divide the data into wealth quintiles. Wealth quintile one is the 
right? Least wealth quintile, wealth quintile five, is the wealthiest quintile. The only point just to make is to see that completion differs by wealth quintile across these 123 different countries. So again, huge success and differences in success um, are not just found here, but it's a global challenge. And this interesting piece of data shows that as well. So you see at the bottom, wealth quintile completion in two years, 10%. For the least wealthy, going up to 46% for the wealthiest across 120 different countries. So we are part of a global challenge. Okay, so that's a bit on the data. But as well as interested to be interested in the data when we're trying to understand this global picture, what's well, a bit about the policy as well? So this piece of research is one that was a, supported by an American foundation called Luba. Produced with our World Access to Education Day initiative, so I'm talking about the moment, about six years ago. This was an attempt to look across the world and get as much information as we could, looking at policy approaches to inequalities and in access and student success. What this report found, the global survey of 110 countries, we found in 110 countries, less than 10% of these countries of a higher education equity strategy. So policy commitment is a huge issue. You apparently, by the look of it, have some things to work through with your policy makers. It felt that way the other day anyway. But you're the only country who has that. Because policy commitment is a huge challenge when it comes to this issue across the world. As a 10% have an access equity strategy, less than a third of countries have any kind of targets when it comes to success or access, but it emulate to equity in different particular groups. So again, and where there was, and interestingly enough though, the country where was, there was greater engagement, this is actually one of them. Because UK, Australia, Canada, US, here, there's actually great engagement in this issue. India to extent as well. Certain parts of the less engagement, Europe for instance, Western Europe, there's actually quite less engagement in this kind of issue. I'll tell you a little story about that. I was in Germany uh, about five or six years ago, and I was giving a presentation. I was in a foundation in Germany, and they had taken a group of rectors, or vice chancellors, on a study trip to the US. When these rectors went to the US, they'd go to uh, different universities, and the president of the university would give a lecture about the university. And by the second or third slide, that president would talk about issues like equity in that college, you know, which students go, which students don't go. And after the third or fourth university, the rector said to um, the person doing the visit, why are they doing that? Why are they speaking about who goes, who doesn't go, who succeeds in that university? Because in Germany, it's not a big policy issue. So in many parts of the world, the inequality exists. But it's not on that political radar. And that's one of the big challenges we face, political commitment, particularly in the environment we face at the moment. Okay. So, not only do we look a little bit at, um, at data and policy, we're also trying to understand a little bit about where we progress to now, which goes back to our UNESCO Challenge of 2030. So we did a survey of 300 stakeholders across the world just coming out of COVID. Trying to think and understand, are we going to make any progress in this area towards 2030? This report we did called The Equity Crisis, Access to Success for 2030. We did this about three years ago. We, we surveyed universities and policymakers across the world. They're just coming out of COVID, trying to work out the impact of COVID on these equity issues. I want to share one particular finding again. 90% of respondents, this is in 2022, thought between now and 2025, participation would increase, dropout would increase, attainment would fall, and graduate employment would decrease. So again, as well as the challenge of policy, availability of data, we also have that challenge coming out of COVID. I mean, a massive, only just being felt now, the generations coming through, I know I've heard some presentations today about in, this conference, about the impacts of COVID upon your students. But it also leads into, into a context that challenge of 2030. Will we see that inequality in SO1 by 2030? Well, 
of course, we won't. And what will UNESCO do about this? So final report I'm going to share before I talk a bit about what we've been doing in World Access Education Network and World Access Education Day is this report here that I would recommend particularly this is one for you to look at because this brings together across the world the kind of initiatives that, um, that you are working on. Because is there enough of that work going on again? Is practice happening across the world but who's bringing that practice together? What we see here is 31 cases, including one on your issue. But what it shows is what's the, this shows what the success factors when it comes to supporting student success. And these four factors here we list, they're sort of you recognise, I guess. Individualised support, mainstream with the institution, continuity, and information system. But that report is really excellent. And it brings together cases from across the world, not just again from Africa, from Asia, from Europe. As well. So, I really recommend uh, having a look at that report. If you want to find out some of the things that happen across the world, you might be able to translate into your own particular individual context. Okay, so that's a brief trip uh, looking across the world at the data situation, the policy, whether things are going to improve, a little bit of insight into some of the case studies, work that we see, what are the factors, plus 31 different countries make a difference in student success. So, before we look, at what we're trying to do in this area. What's the four big issues coming out for us leading to our work in Wahe? It's data, again, it comes out in your conference in those four days. It's a global challenge as well. Do we know what the differences are? And do we want to collect that information? What's really interesting, I guess, in some of the conversations I've had about not just collecting information, but letting it go as well. You're, this, you're not the only situation in South Africa where governments where you collect the information, they don't want to send it. And in some countries, they don't collect the information because what if you show another form of inequality, it's not a political problem to deal with. Political commitment? How do we engender that political commitment to this issue? When it's contesting priorities of policy makers, other forms of inequality, limited budgets, how do you put your challenge higher up that political that policy agenda? The university model. We're moving from a model that was disrupted in many countries to allow only a small minority of population to come in and then succeed. So they need far more students to come in and then succeed. And that model of university of higher education, does that need to adapt and change? The thing about higher education institutions, they're slow to change. There's a merit in that, because they're built on structures, they're built on consultation. But of course, at the same time, society can be quicker than they are. And also, finally, an equity backlash. We've also seen some of our work, a backlash against equity. Once you start to bring more students into higher education, different backgrounds, once you start to bring more in, who succeed, there are some who will not like it. We're seeing that now in the UK. There's been a big pushback in the past four or five years about having more students. There's too many students now, many believe, in the UK. Too many students graduating, entering, and trying to get degrees. Too many students, the backgrounds that we support. It's interesting that it's those papers, those, the media, that are read by those from the higher social economic groups who believe there are too many students. I'll need to work out why you think there's too many for too many students. But to have in some countries in the world say too many students, we have to now think too many. There's a backlash. It's not only in the UK as well. So after all this, what needs to be done? What do we try to do? What we try to do in recent years is think about creating what we call the World Access Higher Education Network. Now I'm sensitive to the idea that it's only accessing the name. We could change it to success as well, but for us, Access doesn't just mean getting, it does mean success as well. It's not just about entry, it does mean success. Access without completion, without achieving your potential, to access and so on. So why did we try to support and, and develop this initiative? Again, as we said from this presentation, we've got a global problem here, a global challenge. We want to try and also add value to individual countries' activity and their advocacy. How can being part of a global community I balance what you do, your individual work, in your institutions, in your organisations, and your students. That's one of our questions we're trying to grapple with at the moment. 
Well, you surely believe that a global access and access community can have that kind of value. And it's sort of get a little bit of proof of concept with this. We'll go back a little step from Whitehead, which I'll finish with, to what we call Whitehead. So about <coughs> 10 years ago, uh, I was involved in trying to develop two global conferences, a little like this, for those working on student success and access. We did one in Montreal, we did one in Poland from Malaysia. They were great events, but they were difficult to do. Because this isn't a space in higher education, like in some of the research areas where there is the money to travel across the world. And many people come to me and say, I want to come, but can you provide me funding? I have a scholarship to come, because my university, I don't have the money to pay for me to go to Montreal to some of the conferences. We didn't have that kind of So we took a step back and said, look, we need to do something different. So you said, okay, well, let's try and do a day, an international day of action, where you can do, you can, cel you can celebrate the work you're doing, raise the awareness of the work you're doing, in your own environments, in your own universities, in your own organisations, but put it under the global banner. <coughs> so we launched in 2018, World Access to Education Day. The International Day of Action, or the quality of access to success in higher education. So I know some colleagues in here I've worked with knew about Whitehead and did things on Whitehead as well. And it showed that over five years we did Whitehead, that by having that ability to connect your work to a bigger international agenda, and we valued what you were doing in your work. You raised awareness. You developed a sense of new collaborations. And of course, in the middle of Whitehead, we had the pandemic. And of course, what that did was open up and legitimise online communication. So the last three years, we have a very large global online conference, allowing them to connect their work, learn, share practice, build connections, collaborations across the world. So as Alan said, over five years in Whitehead, a thousand organisations participate in over 100 countries. Some doing things in their own particular country, some connecting for online events. We believe that showed that there is a value in, in looking at internationally. If you believe the value in convenient collaborating here in your own country, that would be internationally as well. Not only is that convenient as well, it creates that global momentum regarding the importance of the work we do. And that's that policy question that's absolutely crucial. So where are we now? We didn't finish Whitehead because uh, we didn't believe it was valuable anymore. We got to a point now, as everybody does in these issues, where we were a little short of funding, and we felt we needed to build up something a lot more rounded than just wide. So we're now at the point which I developed World Access to Education Network. And we'll be lucky enough now to have some partners working with us. And just some of our partners here, Presby, of course, we're willing to have supporters in some respects here. We have also the World Bank, UNESCO, some of the major global agencies are working with us on wide. So we do have some global support for the initiatives. But at the same time, it's a very early stage. So what will we do, or hope to do, in a way? Again, we'll focus on capacity building. We'll try to create opportunities for you to link with others across the world on your work, primarily online, as I should suggest. We'll also be able to create those communities. We will bring Wahe back, hopefully next year. We believe it's an important symbol of the work we're doing. It's a, it's a kind of focus point around what we can do. We'll bring a lot of convening work together. We'll create also a space where we can bring together that kind of interesting practice I've shown in that report before. Because I also strongly believe that the kind of work that you're doing here deserves a global audience. There's, I mean, some much that my network in New York can learn from what you guys are doing here. We're short to learn that. One of the things I guess about Ryan as well, for your domestic network in New York, is I, I always feel that we've got such a well developed system in the UK, we believe that challenges can only be solved by other UK people. We need to open up that perspective. And research and advocacy as well. While these agencies I listed before are involved in why, many of them, education or inequalities and access, are high on energy. UNESCO are committed to some respect for UNESCO's commitments, but we understand that focus more on primary school, I should. In many parts of the world, people aren't finishing school education, I understand that. 
But we also work with them that have patients part of the agenda. So if you're white, we'll take the choose the capacity building, the search, and also the white as well. We'll all put up possibilities for all those who want to be with us. It's a genuinely global community we want to create here. And it's not just about what we believe white to be, hopefully what white to be something that those who can participate in. So, again, if we relaunch ourselves in August 2024, and in the, uh, my last slide, hopefully through the event, we can disseminate information, we'll send the, the, the link uh, where you can uh, mention, if you like, get further information, and we form the launch network again in December this year. I guess that's the end, nearly, of my presentation now. Before I finish on why, I'd just like to say that it's been a wonderful experience being here, and I feel really privileged that Chris will have to come here. I will say to you that, you know, retain that belief in the work we do. That's so crucial and important. Because at the end of the day, it's that belief that will take you through. It's that belief that allows us to continue with Neil through this and take wider forward. That sense of that community you created. It's a precious thing, that belief in that community. And I strongly encourage you to, to continue to have that. When you go back to your work, be nourished by the experience you've had in the last four days. I know you're part of that greater community. Because I know that part of doing this work in universities can feel isolated at times. You can feel you're the only person, the only team, the academics doing this, but you're not part of that. You're part of something more. You're doing something really, realistically. It's not just changing your universities, your country, by bringing more people into higher education, letting them help so they succeed. You're changing that, you're changing the world. You know you're changing the world, but people are telling you you shouldn't be doing that. So good luck with that, and I'll ask some questions hopefully. That's how to stay in contact, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for an inspiring and um, widely acknowledged throughout the world. And we suppose we can always think about being part of this course. So, what kind of questions will the audience like to ask? Focus. In my university itself, 
was in export techniques or technical vocational, but also again across the world, we also include high professional learning as well. So like in Germany, in Europe, you have a binary system, you know, where you have an academic or vocational part of the system. So we include that as well in our understanding of what we might have education. The tertiary preference is also more complex, but we include that in our ideas of how education is. Well, you just couldn't find data in those countries. So in Greenland was one of them. There was, I think, there was some countries in in Asia as well. We couldn't find data okay, for. Okay, understood. So basically, every every country we found data was in what? Those where we couldn't find, um, where basically ninety percent, maybe ten percent of the countries we couldn't find data for. So. I reckon it's a quality as well as a good fact. That is really an issue. Any more? Yes. Thank you. activities per year, including an annual conference, uh, like this one, and members, non-members pay to attend those all Australian events. And through that income, we have a small secretariat, uh, myself and some others, who manage and take the, the initiative forward. Uh, but it's a constant uh, challenge because um, we have a relatively small subscription fee compared to other networks in the UK, which means that you have to continually have these trade events, passive and stuff that people will go to. And we're experiencing challenges at the moment because the UK, in England anyway, the higher education system isn't funded to the degree it needs to be. And we're experiencing quite a lot of financial pressure. So in the past year, many of our members have been able to afford to send people to the passive training activities. So we are experiencing those challenges. And but also, of course, by having a relatively small subscription fee, we have the majority of uh, universities members. We could put up the fee significantly, but we would only have half the members. And part of the, I guess, rationale of NEON to try and create a national organisation and a national voice for this work. So to do that, you have to kind of include as many as possible. But it's challenging because we have both the more selective universities, Oxford and Cambridge, some of the bigger universities, some more technical universities, more specialist ones as well, that only offer a very small and off particular uh, or vocational based subjects. So we have to try and maintain that kind of grouping by offering activities that meet the needs of very different kinds of institutions. When you talk about a higher education sector, like in any country, it's actually not one sector, but many little sectors. They're you know, based upon history and reputation and, and all that kind of thing. So for us, that's a, a, a kind of major challenge. But as well as the, as the activities, we undertake the search projects as well, where we can. Uh, that's an important part of our work. Uh, particularly, um, trying to engage policymakers as well, on behalf of our members. Um, it's been a difficult uh, few years for higher education in England. Uh, the government we've had has been um, quite anti higher education, uh, as I said before, um, talking about there being too many students. We had a, a major conference online just when COVID started. We had there the higher education minister. She came online. It's always good to have a minister at your event. We're excited. We have 700 odd, I think 700 plus people online. In the three minutes in, she basically said that all the work you've been doing since 2004 uh, is a waste of time to all our members. So from then on, that narrative was quite difficult. We've got a lecture coming up, as I say, next week, and hopefully the environment will change for us, but we'll continue to advocate to policymakers, produce research, both for access and success, uh, that support our members, and also 
hopefully uh, bring policies towards our area work. Okay. It's very interesting, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm sitting here and thinking inequality in England. What does it look like? Because we, we have been sitting here and issues of access and success for us here are clear. What does it look like to talk about inequality in this other country? Let's just take that as something. In what sense? What does it look like? Like, so is it the data or is it the reality? What, 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 what would you like to be to talk about? So I'm working in the pre university space. Mm -hmm. And my issue of inequality is for the students that I work with. It's access to university, starting where the teaching is not resourced well enough for the classes. The university, for example. So I'm trying to now say, what does it look like? The, the normal poor child will not get into university because they don't have money to pay admins. But those other social economic and other problems that I hope you will listen to here, will they be the same on the other side? Well, yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of inequality, on one hand, it's economic. Obviously, in England, you, there is no support available for, in terms of grants or financial support for any students. So you have to pay £9,000 a year to go to education. So I don't know that in band, but I might just call it a brand. So plus you have to borrow money as well to, to for your students. So you're talking leaving university with a debt of somewhere between forty and fifty thousand pounds. Now, if you're from a background where your parents earn I say less than fifteen thousand pounds, less than twenty thousand pounds, which for many people I come from is still a reality. Curing that kind of debt is a huge issue. So you've got a financial problem. You also got a support problem. You know, for many of the schools that we support, they have a lot of young people with various forms of challenges and they don't have resources to deal with. What we've seen a lot in recent years is schools in England taking on some of the roles of also welfare staff. So they're, they're feeding the kids to not get breakfast when they come in, they're clothing the kids to keep their parents' cut for uniform. They just have to keep them after school as well, so they can get involved in gangs and get involved in trouble, etc. So all those kind of challenges as well. Then of course you've got that cultural difference. You know, navigating your way to how education you want to go is difficult. If your parents have a boot, don't mean your community's boot, you see that it's, it's not something you were progress to. Plus, of course, you understand the system, the education system. But all those things to navigate. So my, many of our colleagues work in that pre hd space like you do. Trying to provide both, you can't find the financial support, the academic support, a pastoral support, the information support, to enable those young people, particularly, to think that journey, so even if you want to accumulate the debt, if they think they're willing to do that, to be able to actually progress in that way. We have programs in place just like what you do to try and provide that additional support that schools are able to do in many ways. They don't have the facilities, they don't have the career service. They don't get a big rock and roll rising. It's universities that come in for the program. Do you think there are more ways to do this? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, no, this is our operation. You've mentioned in one of your uh, slides um, the, our progression, like the point of deployment, um, which I think uh, is uh, still really. Um, also starts to look uh, beyond student success in university to pre-university, as uh, she just uh, spoke about, and post-university. Uh, so one of the most important things to kind of start having on the ladder is uh, private employment. So, so what I wanted to ask is uh, um, uh, what, what lessons or advice and insights can you share with um, particularly in relation to the data um, around graduate unemployment. Because in South Africa, for example, I think that's, uh, that's one problem we can uh, grapple with, access to the data. Uh, I don't know if that data is accessible in a single repository or it's in different places, maybe that you can use by proxies, places like SARS, the, the revenue authority. 